Hello everyone, this is Stream of Consciousness. I'm Adam Schmuda, your host from the University of Rhode Island. With us is Ed Lamagna, a professor of computer science for 36 years. Dr. Lamagna's research interests are in the areas of computer algebra, design and analysis of algorithms, cybersecurity, cryptography, and educational uses of computing. His work has been published in leading journals and has been presented at conferences and workshops internationally. He is also one of the Honors Colloquium Coordinators on Cybersecurity and Privacy. Thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you for this opportunity to be here, Adam. So to get started, will you tell us how you began serving as the Honors Colloquium Coordinator? Okay, well every year the URI Honors Colloquium looks at some particular topic of societal interest in great depth. Last year it was um, public education. The year before that it was health care. And the topic is chosen f by a committee, a university committee, and proposals are submitted by various groups and then from among the proposals that are selected, uh, from among the proposals that are presented, one of them is selected uh, as the topic for the colloquium. And actually the selection process takes place two years in advance. So next year's topic has already been selected and the planners are already busy doing their work. Right now they're in the process of soliciting uh, proposals for the year after that. So actually, um, a couple of people came to us knowing that we have a strength at URI in the area of cybersecurity and asked us to put together a colloquium on this topic, which we did, and it happened to be the winning colloquium, and here we are. Can you tell us a little more about your background and what is, is your research? Okay, well, uh, my main research area for many years has been actually computer algebra, which is uh, getting computers to do the types of mathematics that we normally think of as a human being uh, doing by hand, manipulating formulas, not just crunching numbers, but manipulating formulas. And uh, within that area, I've been interested in um, computational procedures for doing various things, or computational procedures, another word is algorithms. And I've also been interested in the design and analysis of algorithms for other types of information processing topics. Uh, so the, uh, my interests are at the intersection of math and computer science. And I've uh, been very interested many years in using uh, computers to facilitate the teaching and learning of computer science and mathematics. Some of your research is on electronic voting and anonymous cash. Could you tell us more? Yes. Uh, within the area of security and cryptography, uh, there's a little niche uh, of people who are interested in privacy. And I'm very interested in those two privacy aspects in particular, electronic voting and uh, the issue of anonymous electronic cash. Okay, so most people, when they go and they use uh, debit cards, they're actually linking their transactions with their names. What I'd like to see is some kind of a card that's perfectly anonymous, the same way as if you spend cash uh, that can't be linked to you and yet provides the benefit of uh, having a piece of plastic in your pocket so that you don't have to carry around the bundle of cash. It seems that uh, over the years, uh, using uh, cash has actually been getting smaller and smaller, and now it can fit on a card. Uh, what do you see the future? Well, yes. Uh, as I go to the checkouts at the market or at the pharmacy, it seems as though everybody except for me seems to be paying with uh, debit cards these days. And uh, although I will use credit cards for uh, large transactions, I like my anonymity, so I tend to use uh, cash for these kinds of everyday transactions. Uh, just because I know uh, the kind of data mining that goes on your purchases, that takes place on your purchases. FBI Director James Comey admits that cybercrime has become an epidemic. Do you agree with him? I do think that cybercrime is an epidemic. In fact, I had a friend just last week who I think was the victim of a little bit of a social engineering scheme 
uh, somebody called up and said that there was uh, that the files on his computer had been compromised and they asked him to run some kind of a uh, program that I'm sure they had planted on the, his uh, computer and it showed that 98.6% of his files were corrupted and they wanted $200 to, uh, on his credit card to clean up the, uh, the problem. So that's uh, just somebody that I know just recently that's just who awful. was a victim of one of those kinds of uh, scams. Yes, there's a lot of spyware uh, that's been planted on machines. Uh, there's a lot of other malware and most people uh, are a little gullible to these kinds of things and they click on links in emails from people that they don't know or on websites that uh, they don't really understand and perhaps uh, should not be completely trusting. Is there anything to say that if a hacker cannot get into a computer, uh, into the physical components of a computer, will they be able to find a way uh, to collaborate with others and organize? Well, they, they, they might very well be able to do that. I guess hacking is a little bit of an art, and there are various reasons why people uh, hack, okay? There are some people who, who just do it sort of for the fun of it. It's like it's, it's a hobby for them. Um, there are other people who are trying to uh, make some money, like uh, the fellow that I just uh, mentioned who was trying to get $200 uh, out of my friend. Uh, or fixing something that was some malware that he had actually planted on my friend's machine. Uh, there are others who are like nation states who are interested in uh, uh, planting, uh, well, Stuxnet is a good example, okay? This was a uh, computer virus that spun uh, the centrifuges at the uh, Natanz uh, uranium enrichment plant in Iran out of control, okay? That was actually uh, caused by some malware that uh, got into the plant. And that was obviously done by either the United States or Israel because it was a very sophisticated hack uh, that only a nation state could have pulled off. Uh, there are other people who are hacktivists and they're just kind of uh, activists who are targeting some particular company. There's uh, spyware industrial espionage that goes uh, on. So there are all kinds of motivations for doing hacking. Uh, speaking of motivations, Edward Snowden was a contractor for the NSA and uh, he went rogue and ended up leaking uh, many sensitive classified documents. Uh, on contrast to that, Rafael Nunes was first sought after by the FBI for being part of uh, an online committee known, of wor known as World of Hell. But now, yeah. he is a respected professional and a corporate business owner. Mm -hmm. So there's clearly a complicated relationship uh, with the law. Uh, and sometimes hackers are labeled unfairly as criminals, uh, but then are used later by law enforcement. Uh, so in your experience and in your opinion, when can there be an appropriate time to hack? Um, well, uh if you're a company, uh, you might hire someone to see if your systems can be hacked, and then you would like that person to try to hack in to see what vulnerabilities exist in your system. Uh, I suppose that there are times like uh, Stuxnet. We, we uh, studied Stuxnet in the Honors Colloquium this year, and uh, after Kim Zetter who was uh, the investigative journalist who did the uh, deep disclosure about what happened with Stuxnet had visited the classroom. We did a survey at her request as to whether or not Stuxnet was a good idea, a bad idea, or didn't know. And in some sense you could argue that it was a good idea because it set back the Iranian uh, nuclear program probably by a couple of years and also had we not uh, or had somebody not launched Stuxnet, uh, perhaps uh, we or the Israelis might have bombed that plant, so there might have been a physical attack on the plant uh, if we thought it was a threat. Uh, it was a bad idea and that it kind of uh, sets a, a bad precedent and actually the code for Stuxnet is now out there in the public domain. Mm -hmm. uh, other nation states can see how, a, or a terrorist groups can see how a hack like this was done 
and there's a model for doing it, and there's even code out there that you can go and modify. So that would be the bad, I, uh, the bad side of it. And then, of course, the not sure is there are definite pros and cons of Stuxnet. So uh, it's not clear whether it was a good idea or it wasn't a good idea. I'm torn on that one. What is the white hat and black hat complex? Well, the black hat hackers are the people who uh, are the criminals, uh, the people who are up to no good when they're doing their hacking. The white hats are kind of the people who uh, try to hack into a system to try to find vulnerabilities uh, that they're going to announce so that uh, they get fixed, that, that they're patched uh, to protect companies. Uh, we could argue that uh, the people that do uh, hacking at the NSA are white hats uh, <clears throat> in some of the things that they're doing. You know, if we thought that Stuxnet was a good idea, that would be a good example of white hat hacking. And then there's sort of the gray area in between. I think uh, a very good example is uh, Kevin Mitnick. Kevin Mitnick was uh, somebody who was uh, a notorious hacker in the 1990s. And uh, he was a black hat at that point in time. And he did serve some time. And when he came out, he decided to become a white hat. And he set up a uh, consulting business uh, for uh, firms that were interested in uh, computer security. So uh, he had a security business. He seems now to have uh, kind of reverted into more or less of a gray hat area in that he's now announced that he's selling what are called zero-day vulnerabilities. These are vulnerabilities in system software like operating systems, Windows or iOS or uh, uh, web browsers. And he's uh, willing to sell vulnerabilities for a price. How much would a zero vulnerability I, range from? I don't know. I guess it would depend on what, it, what system it was in and uh, how serious uh, a zero-day vulnerability it would be. Uh, I've heard, uh, well, I've heard numbers for the Mitnick uh, vulnerabilities going from several thousand up to, I think, 200,000, I heard. But I don't really want to be quoted on the exact dollar amount, but something of that, that order. So, so Kim, this is a good example of a gray hat guy. Mm -hmm. So Kim Zetter, yes. uh, she was one of the speakers at the colloquium, and yes. uh, she was the journalist who revealed Stuxnet. Uh, and as you mentioned, and she mentioned, there are pros and cons to digital weapons. Uh, on one hand, they save lives and aren't easily detected. But on the other hand, they can be reversed and then used on us. Um, what kinds of attack is the individual uh, most likely to be affected by? Individuals are more going to be vulnerable to uh, people who are just maybe kids doing malicious hacking uh, just to show that they can do it. Uh, I think that they have to watch out for um, scams that could result in theft of identity, uh, credit card numbers, uh, things of that nature, passwords. So back to some of your research. Uh, you have uh, spent ex extensive time about anonymous searches uh, and how to protect yourself uh, in using very corporate entities, uh, say Google. Uh, what, do you, what could you tell us about anonymous searches? Okay. Well, um, Google actually records all of the searches that you make. And uh, in the uh, class that I'm teaching that goes along with the Honors Colloquium, uh, I'm doing an exercise with the students uh, in groups of around 20. And the current exercise first uh, is tracking what's going on when you're browsing the internet. So I call that first part tracking the trackers. So you uh, say navigate your, well, it, it involves using the uh, Mozilla Firefox browser. And there's an add-on to the Firefox browser called Lightbeam. And with this tool, you can see when you go to a website, what other uh, corporate entities are looking at you uh, on that website. So if you navigate your way to the New York Times, not only do you have the New York Times knowing what you're doing on that website, but they're on the order of about 20 other uh, companies 
uh, that are tracking your, your movements on there. Many of them are doing this to mine data about what your interests are uh, to try to sell you advertising. In fact, Google has subsidiaries. Uh, one of their subsidiaries is called DoubleClick. Uh, and uh, many websites uh, will uh, do tracking for a double click. So you navigate your way to the New York Times and you see this cluster of about 20 other uh, companies that are tracking you there. As part of this exercise, I had the students go to the four major news sites in the U.S., the uh, uh, newspaper sites, the New York Times, um, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and USA Today. And by the time they get through going to those four sites, there were well over 100 trackers. They were quite surprised at this. And this tool really allows you to see this. It allows you to see which, uh, which trackers are tracking at more than one site. There were a few trackers that were actually tracking at all four sites. Uh, whenever you do a Google search, I mentioned, all of that information is saved by Google, and you can actually go to your Google dashboard and see all of the searches that you've ever done. You can see all of the, uh, uh, if you have an Android phone, all of the text messages that you've sent. Uh, so uh, it's a little bit scary to do this, but you could go back to pick some arbitrary day, March 22nd, uh, 2012, and find out all the Google searches you made that day. It's a little bit scary and disconcerting that that information is being saved somewhere and that somebody or some entity has access to it. And of course, uh, other entities like the NSA or the FBI could get at that information if you're uh, the subject of some kind of a, uh, an investigation of some sort. Uh, and even if you're doing nothing wrong, I just find it a little disconcerting that all of this information is stockpiled by you. So um, you mentioned about anonymous search. You could say, well, is there a way to do a search uh, without being tracked? Oh, okay, so the second part of this exercise after the tracking the trackers part is uh, to do anonymous searches. And uh, there's another search engine out there that has gotten a lot of attention recently called DuckDuckGo. And just about nobody's ever heard of DuckDuckGo until uh, somebody who's interested in privacy mentions it. And they don't do any tracking at all, so uh, it's not quite as good in the search results as it gives as Google, but it's a decent engine and I've uh, tried to wean myself off of Google the last few months and I'm pretty satisfied with the results I'm getting from DuckDuckGo. Uh, you can actually go a little bit further and you can use what are called proxies. So in a, if when you use a proxy, uh, a query that you make over the internet would be enciphered. It would go to something like a proxy server. The proxy server can then do your, um, your query, your search query, uh, using several different search engines or one search engine, get some results, encipher it, and send it back to you. And then not even the uh, search engine that you went to knows that you were ever there because it was the proxy server that actually got the information for you. So you have uh, encrypted information going to the proxy server. The proxy server finds the information for you. It gets it back from uh, Google or wherever it gets it back from Yahoo. It enciphers it, sends it back to you, and nobody knows you've been there. And also all of the transactions on the internet are enciphered, so uh, nothing is in the clear and presumably this is all being done secretively. And then you can actually visit those websites in the same way using a, a, a proxy. So that's the second part of this exercise. And Do you see uh, the National Security Agency or the FBI uh, or other law enforcement uh, going after DuckDuckGo or other proxies? or? No, they're perfectly legal. There's nothing wrong with what DuckDuckGo does, and there's nothing wrong with using a proxy server, and there's nothing wrong with using encryption. So it's just a matter of being an informed citizen. It's a matter of being an informed citizen, yes. Most people don't have the technical knowledge, uh, or uh, these things aren't that difficult to use, just the knowledge that these, these proxy servers exist, or that DuckDuckGo exists. People just don't know about them. What would you say academic institutions' top risks are? Academic institutions, well, certainly break-ins to uh, financial records uh, at the university, personnel records, uh, student records, right? So grades, uh, uh, student profiles, things that are actually uh, protected under uh, FERPA. 
uh, and intellectual property. So uh, researchers' accounts and uh, data that researchers have could in fact be hacked into. And what are we doing as a university to protect ourselves? Well, that's a good question. You probably should direct that to uh, Mike Calfane, who's the uh, chief security officer, or Gary Bozolinski, who's the chief information officer at U URI. Okay. All right. I want to thank you, Professor LaMagna, for coming in today and sharing your expertise and experiences. I just want to say that the colloquium so far is, uh, has been an incredible experience and very eye-opening uh, to the audiences uh, just by the sheer number of attendants. Uh, so thank you very much again for coming in. Thank you. We have some great talks coming up. And uh, if you haven't done so, pay a visit to uri.edu slash hc. See who the speakers are. Each speaker has a page on the page. You can uh, find out more information about the speaker and the topic the speaker will be speaking about. Uh, you can live stream the presentations if you can't go to Edwards Hall. And you can also uh, uh, view the, the previous, all of the old presentations are on there in, the, in our archive for you to view. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank our viewers in the University of Rhode Island for tuning in. Uh, stay tuned uh, for Stream of Consciousness. Thank you.